Hello and welcome to today's live Writer's Digest webinar titled Finding the Right Publishing Path for Your Book with Ricardo Fayette. I'm Kelly and I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few details regarding today's webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. You don't have to take any notes unless you want to. You will receive a follow-up thank you email in approximately one to two days with a link to the recording of the webinar. You will be able to replay the recording as often as you wish for one year. The next important note is that we welcome and invite you to ask questions. On the GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your computer screen, you'll see a question box. Type in your question for the presenter at any time. If the question looks like it disappears, don't worry, the collection will well and we'll get to the presenter. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Ricardo Fayette is the co-founder of Readsy, a global network that connects authors and publishers with top editorial, design, marketing, and ghostwriting talent. A technology and startup enthusiast, he is fascinated by the role small players will have in building the future of publishing. He's behind the launch of Readsy's latest initiative, Readsy Learning, a series of free mini courses on writing, publishing, and marketing taught by Readsy's best professionals and delivered to your inbox each day. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Ricardo. Ricardo, you can unmute yourself and I won't jump in unless you need me to. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to uh, today's webinar. Um, so I've done a couple of these for Writer's Digest uh, in the past. If you attended those, thanks for your trust and coming back to this one. If this is your first one, don't worry. I'll be telling you a little bit about myself and uh, and read CNEX before we get into the issue of the day, which is which publishing path is the best for you and your book. So I'm Ricardo Fayette. I'm one of the founders uh, at readc.com. Uh, um, and you can interact with me at any point uh, through Twitter at Ricardo uh, Fayette as well. I'll respond there. I still use Twitter uh, to interact with people. I don't check what's in my feed. That's just like worthless now. Um, Another quick thing about the webinar, I'll, along with the replay, I'll make sure you get the slides as well. So there's really no need to take notes. You can if you want, but you'll get both the replay and the slides with extra links after the webinar. So just sit back um, and relax. Now, I've got a lot of slides to go through, uh, and I'll try to keep it under an hour. So in order for me to focus on the things that uh, matter to you, I'm gonna um, we're going to run a quick poll uh, to ask whether you're more interested in thinking right now about self-publishing or traditional publishing or whether you're completely undecided uh, between the two. So um, I'll let Kelly uh, run the little poll and you'll have a couple of minutes to to answer it and I'll be able to view the results. And based on those, on those I'll um, be spending more time either on the self-publishing part of things or the traditional publishing part of things. Now, a quick thing about Ritzy. So what is Ritzy? For those of you who don't know what we do, uh, we're an international community of top publishing professionals. So that's freelance editors, proofreaders, designers, illustrators, marketers, publicists. We have ghostwriters, we have website designers now, and we're going to add translators in the coming years. Um, so what that means is that we've, we work mostly with people who come out of a traditional publishing company, someone who was an editor for Penguin Random House, and they're going freelance, and they're going to come to Ritzy uh, to list themselves on our marketplace and make themselves available to both independent authors and traditional publishers who want to hire their services. We're very curated marketplace, which means that only people with traditional publishing experience can come onto a marketplace. We get hundreds of applications every week from editors and designers and marketers and people who want to get listed. We only accept around 3% right now, so it's really, really curated. And because of that curation, we tend to work with a lot of people. We work with independent authors, so people who self-publish, debut authors who are still undecided, um, and we also work with small independent publishers who are looking for an occasional freelance editor or designer. And we also work with for uh, for some big five imprints who come to our marketplace very regularly to look for copy editors, proofreaders, cover designers, because within traditional publishing, most of the production process of the book is now outsourced to freelance 
workers, which is why a marketplace like Ritzy makes sense. So a year ago, I thought I'm in a pretty good position. Now I know all these players and how they work to talk about what the best publishing option is nowadays for authors. And as we're going to see, it really depends on a lot of things. It depends on your book and your personality. Um, and so I started putting together a presentation and I've been refining this presentation for over two years now. So I hope you're, uh, you're going to enjoy it. And obviously you can ask me questions. I will address all the questions at the end of the webinar. So if you want to write and send me a question during the webinar, I probably won't be able to see it. Uh, I might. But in any case, ask it again during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So I'm sure to see it and I can answer it then. Cool. So let's get into um, the matter uh, at hand, which is publishing paths. Now, I'm going to start with a lot of things that I hear from authors. And some of you uh, might recognize themselves in these things. Hopefully not, because these are mostly myths and mistakes. So I get a lot of authors who come to me and tell me, oh, my dream really is to find a publisher for, for my book. But first, I'm going to start self-publishing it to get some exposure. And then a publisher is going to pick up the book. Now, as we're going to see later, that is very, very unlikely. If you want to find a traditional publisher, you're much better off going the traditional publishing route, which is through an agent first and then submitting to publishers. If you self-publish your book, chances of finding a traditional publisher afterwards for that same book are meager, let's say, at best. Cool. Another one is authors telling me, oh, self-publishing, I've heard it's 10% writing and the rest 90% marketing. I just want to write, so I'm going to find a publisher. It might be true. A lot of self-publishing authors spend most of, a lot of their time marketing, not most of their time, a lot of their time marketing. However, traditionally published authors have to spend a lot of time marketing nowadays as well. Traditional publishers, especially the big five, will expect a lot of marketing input from you, whether it's for fiction or nonfiction, uh, even more for nonfiction than for fiction, as they'll expect you to actually have some kind of a network uh, if you're writing your nonfiction book. Well, the authors tell me, oh, I've queried thousands of agents. They don't answer me, so I'm just going to self-publish my book. That's not really a good reason to self-publish, and we'll explain that a little bit later. But basically, if you get no answers at all from agents, there might be something wrong with either your query letter or your manuscript. And if there's something wrong with your manuscript, you want to fix that before you self-publish, because otherwise, it's not standard rejection letters you're going to get. It's bad reviews on your Amazon page, and you don't want bad reviews on your Amazon page. The last myth I hear all the time um, is people telling me, oh, I just, I'm selling I've self-published my ebook. It works great. Um, however, now I want to find a publisher to just like acquire my print rights. That's a very rare thing that happens. And it's been publicized thanks to some print-only deals uh, in the past few years. But these are very rare, and they didn't go very well. So that doesn't happen very often. Again, if you want a traditional publisher, if you want to get into bookstores, ah, we're going to see you need to go through a traditional publishing route. Cool. So we're seeing uh, the results here. I see that around 48, around 50% of you are undecided. This is great. This is a perfect, perfect presentation for you as you're going to see both sides of the coin and the options in between. And the rest are mostly thinking about traditional publishing. So I'll try to spend a little bit more time on traditional publishing, how to find agents, publishers, and what to expect from traditional publisher. So let's go. The fact is there are countless publishing options nowadays. So it's not just self-publishing versus traditional publishing. These are the two main ones. But as we're going to see on this beautiful slide, which you absolutely cannot read, um, there are loads of options. So this is a great slide from, uh, from Jane Friedman. She's put together this little table with all the publishing options authors have. And as you can see, there's a lot of them. And it's very hard to get to wrap your head around all these different options. There's different options in traditional publishing, different options in self-publishing. I'll have a slide later that's going to present them in a little simpler way. But this is just to give you an idea. If you really want to understand the market, this is the kind of thing that you have to absorb. Cool. So we're going to go over four things today. First one is a really quick overview of the basics of self-publishing versus traditional publishing, where the main differences are. And hopefully, by the end of that section, you'll have a good idea already of what 
option is best suited for you and your book. Then I'll go deep into self-publishing, how to make the process work for you, even if you were thinking of going with a traditional publisher first but realize you're better off self-publishing, I'm gonna give you a really simple process so that you don't you you don't go uh, wrong by self-publishing. Then I'm gonna go into traditional publishing, how to find agents, publishers, and what traditional publishers are gonna do for you. And then I'm going to go into a very interesting section, which is about going hybrid. Most of the authors I know who do really, really well and who earn six to seven figures a year, they're hybrids. They're working, they're both self-publishing and they ha also have publishing deals with traditional publishers. So this is probably what you should be aiming for if you wanna make a living and a good living out of writing is becoming a hybrid pub, um, hybrid author. Cool, so let's go into self-publishing versus traditional publishing. Now the pros and cons and the characteristics of both ways. This is a very simple table, but I, I think it contains most of the important information you need to um, keep in mind when you think about self-pub versus trad-pub. So in terms of gatekeepers, obviously there's no gatekeepers in self-publishing. The gatekeepers are the readers. So if you want to publish your book, if you want to upload your book on Amazon and Kobo and Barnes and Noble and all these um, e-retailers, you have a 100% chance of doing so. You just upload your file, you publish your book. In traditional publishing, statistically, you have a 1% chance of getting a publishing deal. Now, if you listen to the traditional publishing part of this presentation, you'll probably have a much higher chance. And if you write a good query letter and if you follow the process, you have a great manuscript, these chances can get a lot, a lot higher. But statistically, 1% of authors get a traditional publishing deal. Now, the money, and that's where traditional publishing is very, very attractive. When you self-publish a book, you have to invest in that book. You have to invest ideally in editing. You have to invest in design. I'll go over that and you'll have to invest money in marketing as well. Now, for traditional publishing, you don't invest money. The, the publisher is gonna pay for the editing, the design, the production of the book, the printing, distribution, they're gonna take care of all that, you're not gonna pay a dime. Not only that, but a, a good publisher, uh, a real traditional publisher is gonna pay you in advance. So now bear in mind that first time authors nowadays, they're not gonna get advances of a million or even 100,000 or even 50,000. Like standard advances for, I'm, I'm saying fiction, most fiction authors, first time fiction authors are between $2,000 and $10,000. This is what you can reasonably expect. If you write an amazing manuscript uh, that's part of a trilogy and they acquire your three book and they acquire your rights for a three book deal, you might get something higher. But again, that's very unlikely. What you should expect is between $2,000 and $10,000. For nonfiction, it varies. It depends on, on your platform. If you're um, an Instagram, with millions of followers, you might get, uh, who knows, $500,000 uh, advance because you already have a platform, so the publishers are sure that they're gonna be able to monetize the book. So it's, it, very, very, it really varies on nonfiction. In terms of artistic, artistic control, and that's very, very important for novelists, uh, that's where self-publishing obviously becomes very interesting. In self-publishing, you publish a book, you hire editors and designers, and you should get um, outside professionals' opinions on your book. However, ultimately, you're the one who decides. You make all the editorial, all the design, all the marketing decisions. In traditional publishing, the editor makes those decisions. The publisher makes those decisions, sorry. And oftentimes, you might not totally agree with those decisions. Some publishers do not consult their authors for cover design, for example. They send them the file and say, this is going to be your cover. And maybe you wrote a literary fiction, fiction novel and just like, uh, planning a, a chick lit cover on it and you're gonna be really disappointed. That's happened to several author friends of mine and they, they went on to self-publish. So if editorial control is really important for you, then self-publishing might be the better path. Now, thinking about royalties, I'm gonna go more into royalties in the next two slides, but basically, if you self-publish, you're gonna get all the royalties. Amazon and most e-retailers are gonna get, they're gonna take around 30%. Of your uh, of your retail of the retail price of your ebook, that leaves 70% to you. For traditional publishers, most deals are 25% net, uh, so 25% of 70%. That's around 20%. In self-publishing, for print royalties, it all depends on 
on on your print book and whether you do print on demand or print runs, but you can expect between 20 and 50 percent of retail price in terms of royalties. And for traditional publishing, obviously, you can expect less than 10 percent. And finally, rights management. And this is the last one, but it's probably the most important one. If you're self-publishing, you retain all your rights. That's obvious. Now, what's less obvious is that in traditional publishing nowadays, most traditional publishing deals acquire are deals where the publisher acquires all the rights for the book, which means that um, if a TV series comes out of the book, you're going to get a certain percentage of royalties for that TV series but most of the money is going to go to the publisher. So think hard about rights, even if you get a traditional publishing deal with a great advance. Think, is it possible in my negotiation with the publisher together with my agent to maybe not surrender TV and movie rights? Is it possible to exclude foreign rights? Your rights are really what are going to help you make a living as an author. It's your intellectual property. It's your, it's your bread and butter. So don't surrender all rights just like that because that's what people do. That's not what people do anymore. They're self-publishing. You have a viable alternative. So even if you go Tradpub, think about rights. Cool. So more about royalties because, I mean, most of you, I imagine, want to make some money or at least a living out of publishing. So you want to know how much money you're going to get if you uh, publish through a traditional publisher or if you self-publish. Obviously, the advances that traditional publishers pay you are earned out, which means that in the beginning, when your book sells or after launch, you're not going to get any royalties until the publisher has recouped their advance. Once they've recouped their advance, you're going to start getting, for hardbacks, generally 10% of retail sales. For trade paperbacks, around 7.5% of retail sales. And for mass market, 8%. Ebooks, as I was saying, it's around 17.5%, which is 25% of the net, 25% of 70%, because Amazon still takes their little 20%, uh, their 30%. Amazon and iBooks and Nook, all the platforms that sell e, um, ebooks, basically. And for audiobooks in general, it's 25% as well of retail sales. Again, audio rights are separate rights. So you might have a deal with a traditional publisher. You might want to push for a deal where you do not surrender your audio rights. In which case, they might get acquired by another publisher, or you might do audio yourself, self-publish your audiobooks. And if you self-publish your audiobooks, you earn a lot more than 25%. Now, self-publishing. As I was saying, audiobooks, if you self-publish your audiobooks, you don't earn 25%, you earn 40% of retail sales. If you self-publish your ebooks, as I said, 70%. And if you self-publish in print, it's between 20 and 50%. So obviously, royalties are a lot higher in self-publishing because everything goes to you except, except from what goes to Amazon or the, or the retailer. Now that I've kind of highlighted the main differences to keep in mind uh, between, on the one hand, self-publishing, traditional publishing. And again, that's like, we're going to see there are options in the middle. And bit within traditional publishing, there are lots of different things. There are like big five publishers, digital imprints, uh, small and medium publishers. So this is very general. But I still think it's the main things to keep in mind uh, for, a, for broad thinking about um, self-pub versus trad pub. So now, if you're thinking about self-publishing, I'm going to give you the right reasons for thinking about self-publishing and the wrong reasons. So for me, the right reasons is if you're really confident that your book's going to sell, especially around nonfiction, if you've got your platform already and you've got your newsletter subscribers or your podcast subscribers, or if you basically if you've got any kind of platform with a lot of people who like you and are going to be ready to buy your book, then you might want to self-publish because you're going to get all the returns. I mean, you're going to do the marketing for the book anyway, so you might have, you might as well get 70% royalties instead of 17.5%. 17, 17 Another reason is if you're entrepreneurial minded, you like uh, making decisions on which editor to hire, uh, which cover designer, um, distribution paths, marketing basically if you find if you think this presentation is fun and all these decisions that you're going to make are fun then self-publishing is definitely the right path for you because you're going to get to take a lot of decisions and you're really going to enjoy the process also if you want to keep full editorial control over your story 
that's very important. If you've written a book where you don't want anything major to change. Um, recently, we had an author, Enrizi, and she'd written a book where she had a female uh, character in her, in her novel who was CEO of a big sportswear company. And she sent it to publishers and, and agents that were really interested, but they wanted to turn that female character into a male one. If you're ready to make that kind of concession, great, you're ready to work with traditional publishers. If you're really not ready to make that kind of concession, then you might prefer sticking to self-publishing. And finally, a good reason, a really, really good reason to self-publish is if your genre or your topic is too niche for a traditional publisher. Um, and that's something you're going to see very quickly as soon as you start sending query letters to agents or submissions to publishers, they're going to come back saying, there's not a big enough market for us in this. And in that case, don't be like, oh, God, I need to write another book. No, no, no. Self-publish that book. Even if your market is really tiny, if you can identify that market, with self-publishing, you can reach it. If you write um, a nonfiction book on a very specific kind of diet, uh, that only maybe 2,000 people in the world are going to be interested about, but you know how to reach these 2,000 people, well, maybe you're going to sell 2,000 books. That's not of interest to a publisher, but if you self-publish, that's still going to make you money and it's still worth putting that book out. If you write in very niche genres, like, um, yeah, if you, if you write cross-genre, mostly uh, in fiction, you might also want to self-publish because as you know, traditional publishers don't really like uh, when genres blend. So if you've got a uh, literary um, space opera with uh, paranormal romance in it, you're probably going to be better off self-publishing. Uh, I'd still revise that because it's a weird mix of genres. But if you want to publish that, you're better off self-publishing. Now, the wrong reasons for self-publishing. There are wrong reasons, and I hear them every day from authors. Uh, as I said uh, in my first slide, the something I hear every day is I've been unsuccessful in my queries. I've sent query letters to dozens of agents and I've heard nothing. Uh, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to self-publish. There is a reason um, why agents don't even send uh, feedback if you send them a query letter. There's a reason for that and you need to find that reason. Um, so maybe hire a freelance editor to tell you that reason or ask for beta readers, or go meet agents at conferences and talk to them. But don't self-publish a book, again, that has deep flows, whether it's in the plot or in the characters, or even in, in the market it's, it's addressing. Um, because again, you're going to get uh, bad Amazon reviews, and you're not going to be able to find your readers. So it's better to revise that manuscript first, uh, and then try querying agents again. And if you get one of the good reasons, one of the reasons here on the left for self-publishing, then yeah, go for self-publishing, but don't just self-publish a book because you weren't able to find agents or, or publishers. Understand first why they didn't answer you. That's really important. Another bad reason for self-publishing is people tell me, oh, I've read that there are tons of self-publishers making tons of money out there. Uh, the romance authors on, on Kindle Unlimited, on Amazon, they're, oh, they're making a killing. E.L. James, they just made a ton, of, a ton of money. That's true. However, there might have been a gold rush in like 2011 uh, on Kindle. That gold rush is over. It's really, really tough to self-publish just as it's really, really tough to find a publisher. Um, in all cases, you're going to need to work really hard to make a living out of writing. So don't go into this thinking it's going to be an easy way to make a lot of money. Um, and finally, last reason is people who get discouraged at the idea of like querying agents and publishers and adhering to submission guidelines and things like that and think, I'm just gonna put it out there myself, it's gonna be much quicker. It's gonna be much quicker, it's not gonna be easier. Both processes, self-publishing, traditional publishing, take time, take a learning curve and need a lot of uh, emotional investment on your part and they're not gonna be easy. Uh, I don't think one is easier than the other. One is going to be easier than the other depending on your personality, if you're entrepreneurial minded or not, typically. Um, however, don't just go for one path or the other because you think it's easier. It's not. Now, the right and wrong reasons for traditional publishing. So if you want to find a publisher because you really want your book to be on billboards and bookshop windows and you have this great idea of you being the next Stephen King, 
again, that's like going into self-publishing thinking you're going to be the next E.L. James. Uh, it's it's very unlikely. It might happen down the line, but it's very unlikely. So it's not a good reason. Uh, if you think self-publishing is too costly, now that might be a good reason in some cases. But my thinking is personally, if you want your book to succeed, if you've worked on your book for a year, two years, three years, ten years maybe, it's your baby. If you want it to succeed, you should be willing to invest two thousand or five thousand dollars in it, or or even just a thousand to put something professional out there by self-publishing. Uh, don't think I want a traditional publisher because they're gonna pay uh, for my book and I won't have to pay for the editing and the design. <clears throat> if you really believe in your book, then that initial difference between paying 2000 or getting 2000 shouldn't matter to you. It's the long run, it's the different, the several books you're gonna publish the IP you're going to generate, the different rights you're going to be able to exploit, that's what can make you money in the long term. That's what can make you a professional author who makes a living out of writing. Uh, people who think, oh, I just want to market my books. Uh, I don't want to market my books, I just want to write. Again, I address that. If you're, traditioning, if you're going with a traditional publisher, you are going to have to do a lot of marketing. They're going to ask you to be on Twitter and 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 even worse than that, uh, I find a lot of publishers don't have a clue when it comes to marketing digital books. They're going to be ask, ask you to be on Twitter, have a Facebook page, do a ton of things that are not going to sell any book, um, but that are going to maybe give them the feeling that you're doing stuff in terms of marketing. Um, so expect to have to do a lot of the marketing yourself, and you should, whether you're going to self-publish or go with a traditional publisher, you should educate yourself as to how to, do, to market a book digitally. So Amazon, uh, search, engine, search engine optimization, using Facebook, using social media, all the, these are all things you will have to learn um, whether you self-publish or go with traditional publisher. And finally, I still get sadly authors telling me, I don't think I'll be considered a real author if I self-publish. Now that's just not true. And we're gonna see on the next slide um, why that's not true. Now, the right reasons is are if you want your book in brick-and-mortar uh, stores, that's really hard if you self-publish. So if your goal is to have your book in physical stores, physical bookstores, then yeah, okay, that's a good reason to go for a traditional publisher. If you don't feel qualified to take all the decisions involved in publishing a book, like picking an editorial team, design team, and things like that, then all right, that's a good reason as well to go to a traditional publisher. If it's always been your dream to find a traditional publisher, it's a dream I don't personally understand, but if it's your dream, then go for it. And finally, another big advantage that only traditional publishers have is that they give you access to literary prizes and reviews and um, traditional media outlets. If you want to be in the radio, um, in The Guardian in the UK or in the New York Times in the US, places like that, they're very, they're still reserved to traditional publishing. They still haven't opened to self-publishing. Most of the times because these media outlets, they're owned by the same companies who own the traditional publishers. So they're gonna favor the authors who are published by those traditional publishers. But that's another story. In any case, do not go to traditional publishing because you think self-publishing authors are just not real authors. That's not true. And you know why? Because most people who are authors are self-publishers. There were over 1 million books uh, self-published in the US in 2016, last year. Over 1 million books. It's We don't have the exact data. It's impossible to have it. Only Amazon has it. We're probably between 1.5 and 2 million books. In contrast to that, traditional publishing is only uh, like, 300,000. So the vast majority of titles out there are self-published. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing, but self-publishing has definitely become the mainstream option. More important than that, self-published authors, they represent over 42% of Amazon ebook sales. And that's a study that's been done by uh, Hugh Howey and Data Guy on authorearnings.com. I hugely encourage you to visit that website. Um, they've basically analyzed Amazon rankings and Amazon sales and seen that the, um, basically you have uh, 
a better chance of making a living as a writer if you self-publish than if you traditionally publish. And I don't have the time to go into details uh, about this now, but I will, again, you'll have the slides, you'll be able to click on this link here and you'll be able to read the full study. And it's a really interesting one, really, really interesting one. Cool, now the options in the middle. So as I said, there's things that are not really self-publishing, not really traditional publishing in the traditional sense. So what are these options in the middle? Well, there are hybrid publishers, um, and I'll explain all those afterwards. There are agent-assisted publishing imprints, there are crowdfunding publishers, there are digital publishers, and there are assisted self-publishing companies. So what are all these? Uh, sorry, I skipped this slide. There we go. So hybrid publishers. I do not recommend hybrid publishers. The idea of a hybrid publisher is to say, instead of traditional uh, self-publishing, you pay for the book, you get all the royalties. Traditional publishing, you get an advance, but we get all the royalties. Something in the middle, it's hybrid. So you pay for some of the editing and the design, we pay for some of the editing and the design, then we publish your book, and then we share the royalties 50-50. That's a great idea. Uh, in practice, I've never seen it done too well because when you're a hybrid publisher, uh, let's say end of year comes and you're all about short on cash and you don't, you haven't published any hit that year, you're going to be tempted to say, oh, we're going to charge these authors a little bit more for editing and design so that we can make up for the money lost. Once you're going to feel the pressure of um, of money as a publisher in that model, you're immediately going to start taking a little bit more, charging authors a little bit more for editing and design than you should be, uh, and putting a little bit less work into publishing and marketing the book. And progressively, it's going to switch towards uh, you pay for us publishing your book model. And the way we make money is by getting you to pay for services, uh, which is what uh, assisted self-publishing companies do. So most hybrid publishers are now are questionable, uh, if not or, or dodgy. So you do your research on that. I'll explain right after how to do your research. Then there are agent-assisted publishing imprints, and they're a little bit more reputable. Basically, the idea of an agent-assisted publishing imprint is I'm an agency. I represent hundreds of authors. Most of them, I get them a publishing deal with a traditional big five publisher or with a small or medium publisher. And some of them, I just I'm just not able to place with a with any publisher. And I also have estates. I have um, authors that I used to represent who passed away and now I manage their whole literary estate and maybe I have, I have a backlist of 50 books and I have the rights to those. So these agencies, they create their own publishing imprints to publish their estates. They republish their estates and to publish some of the front list, the authors they currently represent, who they're not gonna, who they're not able to place uh, with a traditional publisher. Again, it's a great idea. Um, it generally works quite well for the authors, to be honest. Now, there is a conflict of interest to be aware of because if you're an agency and at the same time you're a publisher, well, you're supposed as an agent to sell books to other publishers, but you have your own publishing arm. So are you keeping the best titles for your publishing arm? Or are you going to sell these best titles to other publishers, the other publishers are going to start wondering about that. Um, so simple conflict interest to keep in mind. But I mean, if you're represented by an agent, you're already in good hands, if that agent is good. Uh, if they offer you to get published by their own imprint, look into the contract as any other publishing contract, and it's worth a shot. I'm going to do the crowdfunding publishers last year in the middle. I'm going to switch to digital publishers. The digital publishers, they just they act exactly like a traditional publisher, exactly like um, like a big five imprint. And in fact, some big five imprints are digital only. The only difference is they publish eBooks. So you're not uh, they're not going to publish your books as paperbacks or hardbacks. They might acquire the the rights for that though. They just won't exploit those rights. So what they're going to do, again, editing, design, they're going to pay you in advance, going to publish your book, and they're just going to publish your ebook, and you're going to get generally slightly higher royalties um, on those ebook sales. Uh, they're a great option. 
uh, three years ago, no one knew if really a, a digital publisher was a good option or could work or not. Nowadays, we know that it does work. Uh, there are some digital publishers, let me go back a slide here, Bookature, they've been making tons of money and tons of money for their authors um, and they're digital only. And they've launched a number of Amazon number one uh, bestsellers in all genre fiction categories. Um, so it's definitely a good option. If your agent tells you you've got this deal from a digital publisher, don't just dismiss it because you're not going to have your books in, in, in print stores. Uh, think about it because it can be a better option money-wise for you. Now, assisted self-publishing. So this is the self-publishing model. You pay for all the stuff uh, and you keep the royalties, except this you're working with a company that's going to take care of all the production decisions. So they're going to find the editor for you, the proofreader, the designer, the formatter. They're going to make the distribution decisions for you, uh, put your book available as print on demand on all the retailers, set your price, work with you to set the price, work with you to do the marketing. They tend to be quite expensive. Uh, it's obviously going to be a lot more expensive than if you went separately and found freelance editors and designers and marketers, et cetera. But you're going to get hand-holded through the whole process of self-publishing. So if you, uh, you're you not entrepreneurial-minded, but for some reason you still want to self-publish, they might be a good option. And finally, crowdfunding publishers. So crowdfunding publishers are really interesting nowadays. Uh, there's two main ones I like. It's Unbound in the UK and Inkshares in the US, and I really I truly support what they do. It's like a traditional publisher, they're going to curate the books that are submitted to them. So they're not going to accept all books uh, far from that. They're going to select only a few that they think are interesting. Instead of paying for the editing and the design and publishing the books, they're going to put them up on their crowdfunding platforms. And I think everyone's here is familiar with crowdfunding. Um, and, but basically, you get readers to pay to pre-order the book, basically. And those pre-orders, um, are going to amount to maybe $3,000, $4,000, $5,000, and that's what's going to pay for the editing of the book and the design. And then this crowdfunding publisher, Unbound or Anxious, they're going to publish the book, and they're really experienced people uh, in, my ex uh, in my experience with them, uh, so they know um, how to put together a good publishing team. So they're going to publish your book. And the great thing is that crowdfunding, uh, not only has it paid for them, that's good for them, not necessarily for you, um, but it's also created readers for you so that when you publish that book, you've got all the people who pre-ordered it who are going to get the book and share it with their friends and create buzz and you can ask them to leave you reviews and you can launch a book with maybe 50, 100, 450 reviews on Amazon thanks to those pre-orders you sold. Uh, so crowdfunding is a real, really powerful tool and these crowdfunding publishers are doing quite well. They have a traditional publishing model. So they acquire the rights to your book. Because they don't have to pay in order for the book to uh, get edited and designed, there's crowdfunding, uh, so readers pay for that. They are able to offer high royalties up to 50% um, on ebooks. I think that's what Unbound and uh, Inkshares offer 50%. Um, and generally, because they offer a traditional publishing model with a curated selection, so they're gatekeepers in a way, they get access to literary prizes, to bookstores, print, uh, brick and mortar bookstores. They get access to media outlets and things like that. So they got all the benefits of traditional publishing. Uh, and they're generally a lot more flexible. And if you're interested about crowdfunding and think your book could succeed, definitely worth a shot. Now, as you can see, there are many options. There are people, I mean, these are five main ones. Um, if we go back to the Jane Friedman's like uh, table, there are hundreds. So what's really important is to be able to do your research um, and identify the sharks in the water, because there are many sharks in, uh, in the publishing waters nowadays. There are many uh, so-called hybrid publishers who are going to ask you a ton of money up front to publish your book. They're going to be, oh, we're going to share the costs. You just pay 10,000. We're going to put another 10,000. It doesn't cost 20,000 to publish your book. They're just scamming you. Uh, and on top of that, they acquire the rights to your book. You've probably heard of Author Solutions and their different imprints, Westpool Press and um, uh, I can't remember that. Archway Publishing, owned by Simon & Schuster, uh, iUniverse, 
things like that. They're all they're all basically scams in one way or another. So whenever you get an email from a publisher saying we're very interested in your book when you haven't even told anyone about your book yet and they tell you we want to publish your book we just need you to pay us whatever you need to ask yourself questions and so here are a few questions that i think you should ask any kind of service provider how do you make your money like if it's a hybrid publisher make sure that they make money on the publishing side of things and not on the author services side of things how much do i have to pay up front or for services um, what rights do you acquire and for how long? And this is a, a question you should ask every publisher who offers you a deal. What rights and why are you acquiring those rights? If a publisher, if, even if you get an offer from a big five with a great advance, $10,000, and they want to acquire all your rights, ask them, what are you going to do with those rights? Are you aggressively going to pitch, try to get um, a no deal deal for an audio book? Are you going to exploit those rights yourself? Are you going to publish an audio book? Uh, what about foreign rights? Make sure that the people who acquire your rights are going to do something with them. Because otherwise, they hold rights and you cannot do anything about it. And you do not make any money out of it because they're not exploiting those rights. So really, again, be really, really careful about rights. They're your bread and butter. So don't give them away just because publisher has a shiny name or they dangle nice little advance in front of you. Other question, very obvious, what are my royalties on the rights you acquire? If you publish my audiobook, what's gonna be my royalty? If I get a movie deal, what, what's gonna be my share of it? And finally, uh, how will you distribute and sell my books? I think that's a question mainly for small and medium uh, traditional publishers. Uh, ask them if they have a sales team, if they have distributors in other countries, all the, um, small and medium publishers i know in the uk they have they work with a, a distributor in the us and they have a sales team or they outsource sales in the us so that their uk books are in us bookstores so this is another important question you should ask uh, mostly to uh, independent uh, publishers and, and then you need to run a background check any publisher you haven't heard of or you have a doubt about or author services company or anyone you're considering doing business with, even agents, Google their company name plus scam or complaint or review, see what comes up. Ask on social networks, ask on Facebook groups. There are lots of Facebook groups for authors. You can ask on Twitter. Keyboards is great for anything related to self-publishing. It's an online forum. So go on there, sign up, read around. It's a very special crew, a very special crowd. But uh, if you have questions, they're gonna answer them. Then you can ask specialize in our organization. So in the UK, we have the Alliance of Independent Authors, which is the Society of Authors. In the US, there's the Authors Guild, and they provide generally free legal counsel. So if you get a publishing contract from a publisher, go to the Ally, go to the Authors Guild, become a member, and ask them, what do you think of this contract? Is it fair to me, the author? And to detect scams, uh, follow David Gochran's blog and Writer Beware. Uh, these are two really good sources that are basically um watching the industry and shouting out whenever they see a scam or a scammer david goffrin's been leading um a fight against author solutions and their operations for years now uh so it's a good place to to look even tweet him if you have any doubt about any company get in touch make your do a background check basically cool so i'm running super late on time so I'm gonna go very quickly now around self-publishing. Um, I just want to more than give you tips, give you an idea of how the, what the process looks like. And then you can ask me questions. So here's what the traditional self-publishing process looks like. And as you'll see, it basically replicates a traditional publishing one. You should have two rounds at least of editing, developmental editing, and then copy editing. Then you should commission a cover design from a professional cover designer. And then you should um, get a professional typesetter for matter or do it yourself, we're gonna see. Then a proofread on those final files distribution. And as you can see, marketing runs throughout. It's not, it doesn't come here after distribution. You should, if you're gonna self-publish your book, you should start building your platform as soon as you finish the first draft. And I'll give you tips on how to do that. So 
first two steps, developmental editing versus copy editing. If you do not know the difference between those two, take a look at this slide, basically. I'm not gonna spend uh, too much time on it, but content editing for focuses on the structural aspect of your book. So fiction, it's gonna be your plot, your characters, your narrative arc, your dialogue, things like that. Nonfiction, it's gonna be um, the problem you're addressing in your book, uh, how you're structuring, whether your parts and your chapters make sense, um, and whether you're targeting it at the right audience and with the right tone. Then copy editing focuses on the mechanics of the language. So that's grammar, style, fact checking, uh, and attention to style and consistency um, throughout the book. And finally, proofreading is, it's not optional, it's actually quite important, but it's basically a last check on your manuscript by another set of eyes because developmental editors are gonna pick up a lot of typos. Copy editors are going to pick up 90% of the typos and there's going to be but maybe 10% left. If you want to get rid of those 10% or if a big major part of this 10%, then that's the proofreader's job. Um, if you're self-publishing your first book, you might get your copy editor to do the proofreading um, as well. And that's going to save you a little bit of money. And once you start having a lot of money, most self-publishers I know who make a living a good living out of self-publishing, they hire several proofreaders to check their books. How much you should budget for editing? So these are the prices per word. I'm gonna give you this table that's probably gonna be more helpful. So this is actual data that comes from our marketplace. We've worked on over 3,000 books. Um, and most of and most of it's gonna be, has been editing. So we have a lot of data on how much freelance editors charge for different types of editing. So this is, these are not our prices. These are market prices from freelance editors. I want to stress that. Um, so, and they're average prices. You're going to get people who charge less, people who charge more, but it gives you an idea of what you, what you should budget. If you're going to self-publish uh, an 80,000 uh, word novel, for example, you want to get some developmental editing and copy editing and proofreading, uh, you probably have to budget over $3,000. Um, just for the editing. Cool. Um, cover design. Very quickly, I'm not going to insist on how important the cover design is. Um, the average cost is $600. Um, if you don't yet know uh, the value of a good cover, we've got a lot of blog posts on our blog. We talk about that all the time. Um, but basically, we've seen it We've had a lot of authors coming to us for redesign, and for sometimes we've actually paid for the redesign ourselves just to show other authors here. Here's what a real cover, a professional cover, can do for your book. Here's how it can completely change your sales. Uh, there are millions of books on Amazon, millions of books uh, in every category probably. So having a real cover that speaks to your audience is absolutely vital. Budget around $500, $600 um, for a cover design, a professional one. Now, what to expect from a collaboration with a cover designer? I won't go into that too much, uh, but basically there are several rounds. It's not just hire a designer, come back three days later with my cover, done. No, a professional cover designer is gonna provide several concepts. What does that like? Something like this, you say, hey, I've got this book, A Banquet of Crumbs. Um, you tell the designer a little bit what the book's about, characters, what you are thinking of for the cover. If you have no idea, no problem. Leaves them even more creative freedom. And then we're going to come back with several concepts. We're going to see, okay, we could go in that direction or this direction or that one. Uh, as you And as you can see, a vast majority of the designers on Reti, they provide at least three initial design concepts. And that's really important. Do not go to a designer who's just going to produce one concept for you. You want to have the choice. And then there's a second round. You say, okay, let's go in that direction. They're gonna do another round of concepts, generally playing on color or on a few minor things. Uh, and that again, gives you more choice and an idea of another direction um, your cover can take. Again, 69% of Ritzy designers provide two to three rounds of iterations after a first concept has picked. So that's what you should expect from a designer, not just someone who's gonna produce one cover and say, that's it. No, no. There are several concepts that are iterations based on the concept uh, you choose and you can ask the designer to make um, up to three rounds of changes generally. 
and all that for $600. So that's why you pay $600 for a cover. Cool, type setting and formatting. Type setting and formatting a book can be extremely expensive. Now, why is that? Well, because um, for a lot of illustrated nonfiction, it takes a lot of time to type set a book. Type setting a cookbook, which means like doing the interior design for a cookbook, placing the recipes on one side, the images on the other, having nice fonts and all that. You need a pro designer to do that and can cost up to $5,000 to do that. For a very simple nonfiction book or a novel, then it's cheap. It costs less than $100 if you hire a pro formatter to just design and to just put together an ebook. But better yet, you can do that for free. We've got a free program to do that on Readsy. Um, that looks like this on the screen. Uh, you just copy paste your book in there, you import your book, you create your front matter, you create your body matter, your back matter, then you export your book and you ex can export an EPUB file for ebook distribution or a PDF file for uh, setting up print on demand on CreateSpace or Ingram Spark, which are the two print on demand providers. So there are two other programs as well, which you should take a look at, Draft Digital Templates, also a free program uh, like ours, except they're templates. So you just send them your Word document and you get back an EPUB, um, whereas on ours you can write and modify stuff. And Vellum is a lot more similar to ours with a lot more customization options like fancy chapter headings and things like that. The only thing with Vellum is that it's Mac only, so you need to have a Mac computer, a MacBook, and it's quite pricey. It's, um, I don't remember the price exactly, but when you've got free alternatives, I'd personally go for the free alternatives. So that's it for typesetting and formatting. What you have to remember there is if you're self-publishing uh, an illustrated book, you're gonna need to pay for a professional um, interior designer. If you're self-publishing a simple novel, you can use free tools like a Ritzy book editor or draft to digital templates. Um, to put together your ebook and your print on demand file. Then you get a proofreading on those files. You distribute, and as I said, marketing is throughout the whole thing. And that's that slide is just as valid for, for traditionally published authors, by the way. There are two sides, I think, to marketing. When I get asked to, gonna get questions about like how to market a book, I generally say there are two things. The one thing is overall building your platform. And that's, uh, that starts way before you publish your book. You need to set up your author website. You need to set up a mailing list. On your author website, you need to have a clear blending, a simple call to action, sign up to my newsletter, or go buy my book, whichever you want. Ideally, you wanna have a lead magnet there. A lead magnet is something you use in order to ask people for their email addresses and build a mailing list. For example, a free novella, a free chapter, uh, a free additional epilogue or things like that so that people who buy your book visit your website they're going to see oh I, if i i can get a free um a free novella if uh, i enter in my email address so you get an email address they get a free novella everyone's happy and then you've got a reader on your mailing list mailing lists are very important because let's say you publish a book you get 5000 sales on amazon in the first first week amazing uh, you get high in the rankings, you send even more books, you're super happy. So you say, I'm going to write a second book, I'm going to create a series, I'm going to write three more books in that series. You write the second one, publish it. How are the five or 10,000 or 15,000 people who bought your first book going to know that you're publishing a second one in the series? Amazon's not going to tell them. If you don't have them on your mailing list, you're not going to be able to tell them. So that's what a mailing list is for, is having readers you own because you own your mailing list, uh, whom you can uh, tell about your upcoming books. If you're a nonfiction author, it can be about your courses, about your speaking events, lots of things. So mailing lists are absolutely vital. So that's what I is, in my opinion, part of the platform. It can also involve social media presence. If you love Instagram, if you love Facebook, you use the social media and cultivate a readership there. I personally tend to prefer the mailing list and so do most of the authors I know. Now there are things you need to do every time you publish that are not part of your platform. The things you need to do when you publish are setting up your Amazon metadata correctly, and that's valid for 99% of books out there. If you want to sell your book on Amazon, you need to research categories, research keywords, make sure you write as strong a blurb as possible, 
make sure you have your author page through Author Central uh, and make sure you're going to be able to get at least 10 or 20 reviews in the first week after launch. This is a requirement. It's not like something optional. It's if you want to sell on Amazon and benefit from, uh, from the fact that millions of readers search every day for books on Amazon, if you want to be, get found there, you need to get your Amazon metadata right. And finally, you need to have a proper marketing plan every time you publish a book. Marketing plan consists of two main things. Who is my audience? And how am I going to reach it? And I've got a ton of blog posts on that, so you can ask me questions about that afterwards. And I've given a few ideas of channels here at the bottom. You can click on all those links. They've got the link to blog posts uh, on these specific channels, Facebook ads, press promotions, giveaways, blog tours, etc. Learning about marketing uh, is a tough thing. You're going to have to do it whether you're self-published or traditionally published. Um, a lot of authors I know think marketing is a burden. Um, they just want to write. Marketing is not a burden. Marketing is about connecting with, finding readers and connecting with them. And that's the best thing an author uh, dream about, like having readers and talking to them and getting emails from them saying, I loved your book. This is what marketing is about. Um, so you need to adopt the right mindset and then you need to learn about it. And so we've got Ritzy Learning, which is a series of free courses on writing and, and publishing and marketing. And we've got lots of courses on marketing. Some of them uh, I wrote myself. Um, so go take a look at it. It's blog.ritzy.com slash learning. Again, you'll have the link here. Go take a look at it. Uh, and I highly recommend the Book Marketing 101 course to start with if you have no idea about book marketing. Cool, now traditional publishing. Um, this, I'm sorry for those who had planned on staying only an hour. Uh, this is recorded, so you'll get the recording afterwards if you have to run off at some point. But I'm going to have to spend a bit of time on traditional publishing, as most of you seem to be thinking uh, more about traditional publishing than self-publishing. So this is what a traditional publishing process looks like. As you can see, it's a bit more complex than the self-publishing one, um, because there's the, there are these three first steps here. First, you have to find an agent. Then you have to then you get a developmental edit from an agent. So the agent is going to read your manuscript, give you notes on it, and then you're going to rewrite your manuscript based on your agent's feedback. Typically, changing female characters into male ones or stuff like that. So very very structural issues in order for your book to adhere to market standards and what publishers are currently acquiring. Then your agent, hopefully, is going to get you a publishing deal by pitching your book to tons of publishers, and you're going to get a great publishing deal with a great advance, and hopefully they're not going to be too greedy uh, on the rights. So the book is acquired uh, by the publisher, uh, and then the publisher is going to get, it's going to do another developmental editing round on your book. It's going to be done by your acquisitions editor, usually to make sure that your book fits within their brand. Then they're going to send it off to your freelancer for a copy edit. That's where Ritzy comes in. So if you don't really use Ritzy for self-publishing, chances are your traditional publisher is going to use Ritzy for the copy editing anyway. So we're happy, whichever uh, road you go through. And then production, they're going to make production decisions. That's like for printing, font, type of paper, things like that. They're going to get a product cover design done, usually by a freelancer, then typesetting and formatting. A proofread, so in traditional publishing, the run of proofreading is going to be done on the last files, even the printed files. That's when proofreading happens. Then printing, distribution, and marketing. And again, you're going to have to pitch in a lot with the marketing. Cool. Five quick myths about traditional publishing. A lot of people think that if you're the book, if it's, if it's your book, sorry, you're the boss. That is not true. There's a reason why publishers acquire books. When you acquire something, it becomes yours. You lose the rights to your book. So they make the production decisions. Uh, obviously, they're going to consult you on a lot of things, but they're not necessarily always going to consult you on things. It depends on what contract you agree on. Uh, but in any case, you're not going to be the boss. They are going to be the boss. Then a lot of authors think, great, I've got an advance. I can quit my day job now. No, no, no. Whether you are traditional published or you self-publish, chances are you're not going to make a living out of your writing until your third or fourth book, especially for novelists. Um, and 
a lot of authors think that, again, publishers are going to launch a huge marketing campaign. Um, it's going to happen for big name authors. Uh, you're going to get billboards every time Stephen King uh, gets a book out there. You're not going to get billboards. You're not going to get a huge marketing campaign. You will, however, get a marketing team to work with you, and that's still worth something. But don't expect something huge marketing-wise, nor to be reviewed by the New York Times. Um, a lot of authors think, oh, I'm going to, once the book is acquired, it's going to be published in the next year. Generally, it still takes the publisher from the moment they acquire the book, generally two years or more, to publish the book because they've got a, a queue of books. When, author, when publishers come to read C um, for developmental edits, they do so six months in advance. So they've acquired the rights to your, pub, to your book and then the development audit is going to be done only six months later. So take that into account. If you if you really want to have your book out there, you're probably better off self-publishing. And a lot of authors think that's that's the saddest thing, in my opinion, is that if they get a traditional publishing deal for one book, even if it's like the first one in a series, and the publisher requires that book, then the publisher is going to acquire the other books in that series. And that is not true. If they acquire, if you have a trilogy and they acquire the, all three books, which happens very rarely for a first-time author, that's great. If they acquire just the first one, it doesn't mean they're interested in this following two. It means that if your first one sells, then they will be interested in the following two. If your first one doesn't sell, you're going to get into a situation where you have one book out there published by a traditional publisher, and then you're going to have to self-publish the other two, and it's becomes incredibly difficult because if you cannot because you won't have any marketing decisions over the first book so when you launch the other ones you won't be able to discount that first book for example i mean it gets very complicated very quickly and you will often have non-compete uh closes actually within the publishing contract so they'll acquire only one book but they will say you cannot publish other books within this universe so you'll just be stuck with the first book of your trilogy out there it hasn't sold and you cannot publish number two and number three because they don't want to publish it and you cannot self-publish it. So it's one of the sad stories of traditional publishing. It doesn't happen that often, but keep it in mind. Uh, so don't start writing the next one thing, hey, they're going to buy it. Wait for them to buy it. Cool. Now, there are advantages of having a good publisher. Again, I'm really unbiased when uh, it comes to traditional publishing versus self-publishing. Me, personally, if I were uh, I'm going to do NaNoWriMo, so hopefully I'll have a book to publish uh, by this time next year, uh, and I'll self-publish it. So this is my preferred route, but because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm, an entrepre I'm entrepreneurial-minded. But for other people, I'm completely unbiased, and, and they need to make their own decisions, I think, based on their knowledge of what publishers do and don't do. Cool, so the advantages of having a good publisher. You'll get an advance, and you won't have to pay for anything. We've been known through that. You will work with a top editor who will root for your book. And that is, I think, the one thing that authors love the most about their publishers. It's the editor who acquires their book and works with them to make it better. Sometimes it can be nasty because they, will, they might want to change things that you do not want to change. And we're back to the question of editorial control. But most of the time, editor, authors love their editors. And it creates a beautiful relationship that hopefully lasts for years even when that editor switches uh, inevitably to another publishing company or goes freelance. You will get access to literary outlets, reviews, prizes, and traditional uh, media. You will have a marketing team working on your book, and that can make a great difference. Again, it doesn't mean they're going to spend thousands on marketing, but you will have people ready to help you with marketing. Maybe you'll have someone who works for social media within that traditional publisher or a social media team for that publisher, talk to them, work with them, ask them for tips. What can I do better on my Facebook page? Um, how can I maybe do some Facebook ads? Why do you advise me? The more you collaborate with a marketing team, um, the more you, your book uh, has a chance of being successful. And finally, your book will be available for some time in bookstores. Again, there are some sad stories where a book doesn't sell uh, and Publisher has to buy back all the books because like the bookstore wants to get rid of them and books get destroyed. 
that's one of the realities of traditional publishing. It doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen. If your book doesn't sell, it doesn't make any difference whether it's in bookstores and it will not remain there. Uh, your book will be in bookstores for a certain lifespan, the lifespan of the book. A-books don't have a lifespan. They're there forever. Uh, print books do have a lifespan. All right, now I'm going to go into a little bit how you find a traditional publisher. Uh, so now you have all the info on traditional publishing versus self-publishing. If you want to find a traditional publisher, here's what you need to do. For fiction, you probably want a literary agent. Here's why. There are some publishers who accept unagent and submissions. But most, I mean, 90% of the big five imprints, so that's Penguin and um, Penguin Random House, Macmillan, HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster, uh, might have forgotten one in the mix there, probably. Anywho, um, those big ones, their imprints, they will not accept unagented uh, un submissions. So they will only accept submissions from literary agents. So if you don't have an agent, you will not get published by them. Most of the big in independent publishers, like for example, Sourcebooks uh, in the US, they are accept some rare windows, they won't accept unagented submissions. So if you don't have a literary agent, there are a lot of imprints which you're basically not going to be able to reach. You're not even going to be able to pitch your book to them. Now, there are obviously places that accept unagented submissions, and you should probably pitch them at the same time as you query agents. Some big five digital imprints. We talked about digital imprints before. I think all of the big five have what we call digital imprints um, that publish only ebooks for commercial fiction, genre fiction. So romance, thriller, fancy, sci-fi, things like that. They will accept unagent submissions. Um, most of the, of the digital publishers were not part of the, big, of the big five. They will also accept unagent submissions. Some independent publishers, usually smaller ones, are going to accept unagent submissions. The crowdfunding publishers we talked about, and also I forgot in the slide, I will add it for the replay, Amazon imprints. Amazon has publishing imprints. Um, like Thomas and Mercer for thrillers, for example, um, you can submit to those directly and they work like a traditional publisher. And they're really good at marketing as well because they're part of Amazon and, well, you know, people buy books on Amazon. So it's really easy for them to market your book. It's a bit unfair, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if you think you need a literary agent, and I think you, if you're writing fiction, you probably need one, here's the steps you need to follow. Write your query letter. If you don't know how to write a query letter, Writer's Digest has got a ton of webinars and resources on that. Research literary agents. How can you research them? If you're in the UK, Writers and Artists uh, is the best place to look at. They've got a yearbook. In the US, you've got three websites, Writer's Digest, Publishers Marketplace, and Poets and Writers. They all have got listings of literary agents to so go through those. And then Publishers Marketplace is going to require a subscription, though. So you're going to have to pay for that. Might be worth it. Query five agents at a time. Why five agents at a time? Because you've written your query letter, you might think it's perfect, but maybe it has some flow in it. If you query five agents, wait to hear back from them. One tells them, um, this is great, but I don't think your book is interesting to us because of this and that. If you can change this, this, this and that, then you're, the next five agents you're going to submit to, you will have eliminated that problem for your cover letter or your manuscript. So, do it generally. I recommend five agents at a time. Most people I know recommend five agents at a time. You wait to get feedback. If you get a feedback, you polish your letter based on their feedback. If you do not get feedback, then uh, query another five, another five. If by the time you've queried 20 agents and you and you had no feedback, only standard rejection or no answers, there is probably something wrong with your query letter or your manuscript. You want to know what is wrong with your query letter or your manuscript. You don't just want to keep submitting um, and wasting agent contacts, or even you don't want to self-publish just like that. You want to understand what's wrong. So seek a freelance editor's opinion. And that's where Ritzy comes in, by the way. Um, we have a lot of editors who, most of what they do is look at authors' manuscripts before they send them to agents, or after they send them to agents unsuccessfully, uh, and they look at the query letter as well. We've got a, they do some query letter review. 
Submitting direct to publishers, it's the exact same way if you want to submit direct without uh, an agent, so to all these people who accept an agent submissions, same process. Um, additional resources you want to keep in mind for direct submissions, sign up for Google alerts to unagented submissions. I mean, unagented submission is a very, very publishing industry uh, unique term, you know? Uh, if any website or blog or media writes about unagented submission, there's probably going to be an article, five publishers who accept unagented submissions in the month of November. And you want to know about that. So subscribe to the Google alert and you'll know whenever publishers or imprints uh, open themselves to unagented submissions, direct submissions. Also, Authors Publisher Magazine is a good resource. Uh, they generally have a newsletter uh, with opportunities like that. Writers Digest, obviously, uh, and Poets and Writers and Publishers and Marketplace are all good places. Now, for nonfiction writers, nonfiction is a different beast. Uh, you might want to have an agent or, or not. It's not as necessary for nonfiction the, as it is for fiction. So I would probably none of, skip the agent part for most nonfiction books. However, what you're going to need is a book proposal. Uh, and so that's the difference between the book proposal and the query letter. I don't have time to go into the book proposal. I can send you a bunch of resources around that. Jane Friedman's got a great post about book proposal. You'll get the slides. You'll be able to see what you need in the book proposal. Basically, it's an elevator pitch for your book. You need to make the publisher understand what your book is about, why you're the best person to write about your topic, that topic, why that topic is currently hot, uh, why among your per why there's already some competition for that topic, indicating that there's a market for it, but not so much that it is too crowded a market, and what's going to make your book unique. Quick note on memoirs and children's books, because in my previous writers, I just webinars, I always got questions. What about me? I'm a memoir author. Is it fiction, nonfiction? How do I get my memoir published? Same for children's books. They're a bit different. They're a bit in the middle, no? Um, so for memoirs, Please keep in mind that the market for memoirs, especially in traditional publishing, is very, very crowded. So your story needs to be truly, truly, truly unique. Memoirs on addiction or cancer or um, illness recovery, things like that, they need to be really unique because I honestly get one email a day uh, from a memoir author in one of those topics. Um, so it's very crowded. And these are there's definitely a market for it, but uh, know that you're going to have to have a pretty unique take on it. So again, and before you write your book or while you're writing your book, get other memoirs on the subject and see if they're saying the exact same thing you're saying or if they have saying something different or what you can bring uh, to the topic or to the theme that's new. In terms of what you're going to need to uh, query agents, and for memoirs, you're probably going to want an agent. Um, unless you're an accomplished writer, you're going to need both a book proposal, so it's similar to nonfiction, but also you're going to need a full manuscript. So that's similar to fiction. For for other nonfiction, you don't need a full book. You can send the book proposal, and then if it gets accepted, you'll write the book. You'll get an advance, and you'll write the book. Uh, not for not for memoirs. Unless you're a really accomplished writer or you are or you're a celebrity. If you're a celebrity, you send in a book proposal, it's gonna get accepted, gonna get in a huge advance, and you're gonna get a good writer to write your book because you don't have the time to write it. But that's for celebrities. I guess you're not celebrities. Uh, if you are, let me know in the comments. I'd be keen to know that. And for children's books, very important thing that I see everyone get wrong is knowing which age group you're writing for, and that is so important. Uh, you're not just writing a children's book, you're writing a children's book for this to that age, and you need to know what this and that are. Do not get your book illustrated before querying agents. Even if you have um, a spouse or a partner or a neighbor or a friend who's pretty good at illustrations, don't get them to illustrate your book. The agents do not want to see illustrations or even um, suggestions for illustrations or sketches uh, in, in, in manuscripts that they receive, and publishers don't want those either. Aside from that, follow the same results for added fiction uh, and, probably, and get an agent. Um, cool, so I was mentioning, we're getting to the end of this. 
I was mentioning, if at any point you want to make use of Ruby services, work with uh, uh, an editor to polish your manuscript before sending it to agents and publishers. Work with a cover designer because you're self-publishing your book. Work with a marketer because you have self-published your book and it's not selling well, or because you're going to self-publish your book and you want to make sure you've got a marketing plan in place, a mailing list, a website. Work with a website designer. Uh, work with a publicist. You can use this link. Uh, because you waited until now and you stayed with me until the almost very end of this long webinar, you get a special link with $20 discount valid until November 30th. So the end of uh, NaNoWriMo. You can sign up. You just need to sign up before November uh, 30th, by the way. You don't need to hire an editor or ask for quotes or anything. You just need to sign up. Those $20 will get us credits in your account, and then you will be able to use them one year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Yes, we will be running 10 years from now. Don't worry. And if you're a Ritzy member already and you want these $20 added to your account, drop me a line. We will have my email address in the last slide. Cool. Last thing, this is my favorite subject, is changing paths and becoming a hybrid author. Again, stressing this, most of the pub, of the authors I know who are making really, really good money are hybrid. Uh, they're self-publishing and they have a publisher on the side. So what does hybrid mean? Well, I just told you. Self-publishing and having a traditional publisher on the side. Generally, that's for different series. Example, you're a romance author, you have five series with Harlequin for co uh, cowboy romance, and then on the side, you really enjoy writing rom-com and you self-publish it. Um, that's super common, and again, uh, it's what most authors do nowadays, smart authors do. So that's what you should be aiming for, because uh, you can learn a lot from working with a traditional publisher. Uh, if, even if you've self-published 10 books, you can still learn a lot from getting an experience with a traditional publisher, so it's worth, it's worth it. And vice versa, if you've published if you're a multi-published author with uh, Harlequin, it's really, really interesting experience to self-publish even just one book. You're going to learn a lot of things. Cool. Um, other form of hybrid, slightly bit rarer. You self-publish, but a publisher decides to acquire the print, audio, foreign, or movie rights for your book. Obviously, it's like movie rights. It's not going to be a publisher. It's going to be a production company. This is rare, but this happens. Uh, it happened for... Happened for The Martian, happened for Wool Huawei, and it happens for a lot of self publishers who get their movie rights acquired. The most common is getting your foreign rights acquired. Uh, so you're a self publisher, you're making, you're selling a lot of books, self published books, and foreign publishers spot those books uh, on Amazon and think, oh, it'd be good to it'd be amazing to get a translation. So they contact you or your agent. Uh, Self-publishing authors can have agents too for their foreign rights, uh, and they'll acquire the foreign and publish your book in German, in Italian, in French, in Spanish. Generally, when I to my author friends who sell um, hundreds of thousands of books every year and want to get into foreign markets, they ask me for translators. How can I get a translator so that I can get my book translated and self-publish it in Germany, Italy, and Spain? The thing is, in most other markets aside from the English one, um, readers buy print books in bookstores still. So if you self-publish yourself and sell on just on Amazon, it's going to be really hard for you to hit the overall readership of that country. So it makes more sense to get your foreign rights acquired by a foreign publisher. So if you're really a hardcore self-publisher or you become a hardcore self-publisher, still think about traditional publishing for foreign rights. It's worth it. Another form of hybrid, a lot more unlikely. You self-publish a book, but it's done so well that you've gotten a publishing contract from a traditional publisher, a big five. Now, why is that unlikely? Because it happened a few times. Great example is Hugh Howey with Wool. Uh, he actually got a print, print deal only, that's, that's later. Well, it happened a few times and when the, books, the self-published book has reached its market and the publishers republish it, then they're not really going to sell a lot more. So the publisher is going to think, oh, this didn't work out. Well, it's because the book sold a lot in the first place already. Um, so publishers tend to shy away from doing that. 
if you sell a lot of books, it's definitely good to uh, get an agent and that agent will be able to pitch your foreign rights, your movie rights, and your rights to other books. Uh, but getting the same book republished by this by a traditional publisher, even if it's sold a lot, it's really it's going to happen. Andy Weird happened with uh, with The Martian. Um, but other but if you're if you don't write a book as good as The Martian, it probably won't happen. And even more unlikely is people who self-publish but get their print books distributed by a traditional publisher. That so that's like getting a not a publishing deal, but a distribution deal, which means that they're going to get your book pitched by their sales team and distribution teams to bookstores all over the country. And the one instance, one person who's done it, I think, is Tucker Max with his nonfiction, and I think Hugh Howie with Wool did it as well. It's something to think about, honestly, if uh, if you're selling a lot of books. But I mean, this is just to give you an idea of like different forms of hybrid and the things that exist. If you get to number three or number four, you're going to need to move a lot of books um, before you, you can even consider those, consider those options. So what's a bit more realistic if you want to go from self-publishing to traditional publishing? Well, the normal path, the logical path, would be I self-publish a book. Then I write a new book. I find an agent for that new book, and I sell the rights to the publisher for that new book. That's a traditional uh, path from self-publishing, traditional publishing. It happens on a different book. Again, if you want ha it to happen on the same book, which means you self-publish a book and you want an agent for that book and you want a publisher to buy that book and republish it, you need to sell at least 500,000 copies, in my opinion. Um, or maybe a little bit less, but like very high amount uh, and get very visible and have a really good agent because... Otherwise, publishers are not necessarily going to be interested in like um, buying the rights to an already published book. They're very, very loath to doing that. Except for Amazon publishing. If you're a well-selling indie author, and we've had several examples of that with Reach the Authors, um, you're probably going to get approached by Amazon publishing imprints. And then in, that, in those cases, I'd say go for it. Definitely go for it because there's no one better at marketing than Amazon because they control the distribution of the books. If you want to go from traditional publishing to self-publishing now, so in the other sense, there are things to think about. Well, you, um, there are two things that could prevent you from doing that. If it's for an existing book or an existing series, you will need to get your rights reverted to you. So you will need to make sure that you can, you have a rights reversion clause in your contract and see how it works. If you sign a deal with a traditional publisher, please, again, rights, please pay attention to the rights reversion clause. Make sure that it's fair to the author. Um, consult with Society of Authors in the UK, Authors Guild in the US, to make sure that they're fair. Um, and the second thing to think about if you have a traditional publishing contract and want to self-publish, think about exclusivity clauses. As I mentioned, if you got published uh, for a series, you might have an exclusivity clause in your contract that prevents you from writing uh, in the same universe or using the same characters. So you obviously you don't want to go against your contract with the publisher, so either you cancel that close, you negotiate with them, you're going to see. But these are the two things that can prevent you from going from traditional publishing to self-publishing. Otherwise, nothing prevents you from just writing a new book and self-publishing it, um, rather than selling it to the publisher again. Again, these two organizations I mentioned, really important uh, for everything regarding rights, which are your bread and butter. Alliance of Independent Authors, uh, they're UK-based, but they're international, and they do an amazing job. Uh, at Legal Counsel and the Authors Guild, uh, paid organization in the US, again, amazing job at uh, Legal Counsel. And finally, if you are thinking about this whole hybrid thing, you need to read Kristen Catherine Rush's business musings on her blog every week. She's a hybrid author. She's a, her own agent. She fired uh, her agents because they were doing a poor job. She sells her own foreign rights. She's she's a, a real maverick. Um, she's absolutely amazing and you can learn a lot from her experiences and her publishing wisdom and 
she makes a living out of writing and a pretty a pretty decent one and she knows the importance of rights so lots of things to learn from her in fact i stole a bunch of stuff from her for my presentation but i'm sure she's fine with that didn't really steal um so we reached the end of the presentation thanks so much for everyone to staying through it you have that 20 dollar link again here but until november 20th a 30th sorry long webinar um, and any post webinar questions that you're not asking me now because you want to spur my voice, uh, you can send me by email to ricardo at readc.com. And now I'm going to take questions and I'm basically going to look at the latest ones. Yes, uh, I misspelled here, Kristen Kirschman in Rush. Thanks for letting me know and I will correct uh, it in the, in the next one in, in the slides. When should I start a website by Elizabeth? Well, Elizabeth, um, by the time I'd say you're, you have a solid draft of your manuscript. So before, around the time you commission copy editor, when you start thinking about copy editing and cover design, uh, start a website or hire a website designer. Um, definitely a good month or two before you publish your book. Can I recommend someone to edit a query letter? Yes, it depends on your genre. The simplest thing is you send me an email at ricardo.rit.com. Uh, tell me a little bit about your book. And I'll recommend editors specialized in your genre and with traditional publishing experience. So Exacore and editors or ex literary agents, basically. How long should I wait for feedback from an agent query? Uh, I've gotten this question before. How, how did I answer it last time? Um, a couple of weeks, I think. A couple of weeks to a month. So probably query the first five agents and wait for at least two weeks. And if you hear nothing within the first two weeks, it's okay to possibly chase after two weeks. Uh, but give them a good two weeks before you chase. Don't chase after a week in any case. But do chase. It's okay to chase. I mean, you're sending them your manuscript. so. Cool. Um, if you send your book to a crowdfunding site but don't get picked up, will traditional publishing agents still accept you? There's a distinction to be made here. So if you send it to like Unbound and Inkshares and they say we're not interested, as in we're not going to put it on our crowdfunding site, that happens again for 90% of the submissions they get, uh, then it's like submitting to agents and publishers. Obviously, you can submit to other people. No problem. No one will know about it. It's just like getting a no from an agent or no from a publisher. It's going to happen to all of you. Uh, and you have to move on from that no and ask other people. If, if, if they accept your book, put it up for crowdfunding on the side, but the book doesn't reach its target, um, then you're going to get a little bit stuck, I think. Uh, <laughs> so there's a little, there's a small danger zone there. Because the book, won't have been published, you will still be able to submit to agents and publishers, but you will probably have to disclose the fact that it was up for crowdfunding. However, you will have like gotten pre-orders on that book. So even if it's crowdfunded, like 50%, it reaches 50% of the target, so it's not enough uh, for interest or inbound to publish it, they will still give you options to publish it, generally self-publishing. Um, but once you enter within the crowdfunding publisher, it's gonna be hard to switch from that to an agent or publisher. Any books or resources on marketing I recommend? I've honestly preaching from my own core, but uh, Reedsy Learning. Uh, so just Google Reedsy Learning and all our courses on marketing. Take them. Um, they're free. They ju last just 10 days. And more importantly, they've got links at the bottom for further reading. Um, other than that, if you want me to recommend non Reedsy resources, read David Gogren's books. Let's get digital and let's get visible. Let's get visible on Amazon metadata is the best thing you can read. Um, so do, uh, do, would you recommend an author use one name for traditional publishing, a different name is self-publishing in a different genre? Don't use different names for self-publishing versus traditional publishing. Use different pen names for different genres if you want. I would recommend that, yes. Um, but if it's within the same genre, use the same, use the same, pen, use the same pen name. You want to build a brand around books. You don't want to build a brand. Basically, you want to build a brand for readers. And readers don't care whether the books are self-published or traditionally published. 
uh, so that decision shouldn't have any influence on your pending. Uh, do I recommend trying to be whimsical with a query in order to stand out or keep it more traditional format for the query? That's a tough one. I think most agents I know would say keep it in within a traditional format. Um, I'm, a I'm, I'm a whimsical guy, so I might try like whimsical query here and there. Depends how you define whimsical. Definitely do not like put glitter in the envelope. Do not like put weird stuff in there. Do not send them gifts. Uh, gifts, sorry. Uh, nor gifts, by the way. Um, and to do, do not do anything weird. Whimsical, you can try it. You need a really good hook. The first thing in a query letter is a really good hook at the beginning. Uh, it can be whimsical. It can not be whimsical. Generally, there are two types of agents that I know. Um, but in, there are two types of answers that I get from agents when I ask them about the hook. Some tell me the hook has to be something about my agency. I see that you represented blah, 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 and my book is um, similar. And the other one is like a hook related to your book. Uh, so like short one sentence about, I don't know, the theme of your book, mankind, I'm the last survivor of the human race and whatever. Um, but if it's, I'm, I, honestly, yeah, no, I think most agents would be against whimsical. Um, should very different normals use different pen names? Why is that a thing? And you probably should expect that. Um, it's a branding thing. It's a branding thing. Uh, let's say you have a website under your name, Salem uh, Wolf, uh, or Wolf, sorry. Um, and you've got books on urban fantasy in there and books on co co cowboy romance. Sorry, picking like completely different stuff. Uh, readers who finish your urban fantasy, they're going to click through your website. They're not going to want to see all the stuff about your cowboy romance. They're not going to give a damn about that. Um, on Amazon, if authors see your name repeatedly for urban fantasy and suddenly you see your name on cowboy romance and they're going to be like, ah, it's the same author, I'm going to buy it. And they're going to be like, well, this is not urban fantasy. So this is why you keep drawing different pen names is so as not to confuse readers uh, when you're pretty sure that those read that there's no crossover between your two genres. I know uh, a lot of authors who use the same pen name for fiction and nonfiction because that's really widely different and they keep it in different places in the website. It's up to you in the, in the end, but it's a branding question more than a publisher is expecting that or not. How do I start building my online presence as a fiction author if I haven't published a book yet? Okay, that's the number one question I, I get, I think. Um, Three ways to do that. First way is creating content. So you don't have your book out, but you could blog. Um, it's very tiring and it's not necessarily something I recommend, but something you can do. You can blog or you can podcast uh, or you can create a YouTube channel or you can create an Instagram account or whatever. You create a following somewhere that you think uh, might be interested about your book. Don't create a following around, I don't know, cat pictures if your book is about uh, urban fantasy, there's going to be no overlap between the audience you've built and the book you're trying to sell. But there's other content you can maybe try to create. Second way is building relationships with people. So an online presence is not necessarily just your website or social media. It can be relationships with influencers. So make friends with other big authors in your genre. That's my single best advice um, for you. It's make friends with other authors in your genre. Buy their books, read their books. Um, leave reviews on their books, connect with them on social media, interact with them. If they have blogs, comment on their blogs. Make Genuinely make friends with them, uh, if you can. And then last thing is doing giveaways. Giveaways are great for building a list. Uh, so for example, you'd say, huge giveaway, I give away the 100, I give away 10 uh, paper gap, paperbacks of um, best-selling science fiction authors. You organize a giveaway, you can use King Sumer or Rafflecopter for that. Um, you advertise a giveaway through Facebook ads. You also build relationships with these 10 best-selling authors. You ask them for permission for giving away their book. 
and then um, hopefully they're promoted to their audience as well. And then you will gather a list of people who enter your giveaway and it's a mailing list you can then use to promote your book. So these are just three ideas for building a platform before you self-publish or get a publisher. Uh, current insights on the market for short story publishing. Uh, I'm really not a specialist on short stories. Um, we have a really good short, uh, short story, a Ritzy learning course on short stories uh, by one of our top editors um, who's worked with some amazing authors. What she mentioned in there is there's a lot of online literary magazines publishing short stories and that's where you should start. Basically pitch your short stories there. The market for anthologies is a really tough one um, for, for, for publishers, for traditional publishing and even for self-publishing. But short stories are great if you have a novel, something to give away as an extra piece of content to gather emails as a lead magnet, basically. Is it worth gaining a following on free platforms such as Wattpad with your earliest works? Yes and no. Uh, Wattpad is great, in my opinion, to exercise your writing and to start getting reader feedback. And it might, be, might not be the best feedback ever because these are teenagers reading what you write on there, uh, but it's still valuable feedback. I mean, if you write for teenagers, you want to know what they think about your books, about your writing. Do not use it to build a platform because you will, again, reach a lot of people uh, who read on Wattpad. You know how many books are on Wattpad? Enough for them to read for the rest of their lives. So they're not necessarily going to go to Amazon just because you tell them, hey, my book's now available on Amazon. They'll be like, okay, thanks. But one, I already read your book or parts of it. And two, I've got these other 1,500,000 books here available on Wattpad that I need to go through before I go purchase books on Amazon. So this is why Wattpad is not necessarily a good idea for marketing a book. It is, however, a really, really good idea for honing your writing craft and getting feedback from uh, readers. I will provide a link to the page showed uh, on Jane Friedman traditional versus traditional self-publishing slide. You'll get the slides after this webinar tomorrow. Uh, and the, that slide contains a link to um, to her blog post on that with that little table thing. So you'll have it. Publishing crowdfunding versus other crowdfunding like Kickstarter. Uh, cool, so it's the same difference as self-publishing versus traditional publishing. Uh, crowdfunding publishers like Inkshares and Unbound, they're gonna acquire the rights to publish your book. If your book gets funded on their platform, they're gonna give you a traditional publishing deal. They're going to buy your rights. They're going to exploit, the, exploit those rights. They're going to publish your ebook um, and, and your print book. They're going to distribute them. are going to sell them. Um, and you're going to get royalties. Kickstarter, you put together the campaign on Kickstarter. You promote it. Um, and if you get funded, you hire an editor. You hire a designer. You go through the whole self-publishing process, except you have the funds to do it, which is pretty cool. And when you go on to publish the book, you've got an audience already of people who backed your campaign that you can leverage to launch your book. So I think Kickstarter is really an awesome idea for, for self-publishing and uh, an underutilized one by authors. However, it is true that Kickstarter projects tend to be more illustrated. So if you've got a graphic novel or photo book or um, anything that's a little bit illustrated and visual, even if you've got like little sketches in there, children's books uh, work amazingly well on Kickstarter, use it. I will be sending a copy of this presentation to all your emails and a replay of the webinar. Um, how long should you sign with an agent? What if you want to get out of the agreement with them? It's a tough one. Uh, it depends on your contract with the agent. Um, generally, most contracts you can get out of pretty easily by your mutual understanding or even unilateral uh, with a certain notice. Um, they might still, however, um, require to 
to keep the royalties on the rights that they sold. So if they got your publishing deal and you get out of the relationship with that agent, you might still have to um, pay them 15% of your royalties on, on, on this book they sold to a publisher. So that's, again, yeah, it really depends on your contract. I mean, and how long you should stay with, you should stay with an agent, as long as they're doing something for you. It's as simple as that. If you feel that nothing's happened in a year, they haven't sold any right, there's no reason for them to stay for you to stay with them, then get out of it. Or tell them, wake up, or I'm gonna find someone else, or I'm gonna become my own agent. Uh, I do have a PDF sure, version I can share of this. You will get it tomorrow. How can you evaluate whether an editor is right for you? Can I ask an editor to do some sample pages for you um, for a fee? Mm, Yes. So I'm going to give you my perspective on Reedsy. On Reedsy, you can reach out to up to five editors with one single brief and get their thoughts and sample edits on your brief. Most of editors I know will do sample edit for free, for copy editing and proofreading mostly. For developmental editing and editorial assessment, it's really hard to do a sample. Why? Because these focus on the overall structure of the book. So they can't do a sample on your first chapter. It makes no sense to developmental edit the first chapter. However, what they can do is show you an editorial assessment, an edit letter they've done on another manuscript, um, which will give you an idea of their editing style and of the type of feedback you can expect from them. So how do you evaluate whether an editor is right for you? Look at the books that they worked on in the past. You can see for all the our editors on Reedsy, you can see exactly which books they worked on in the past what publishing companies they worked on in the past, uh, and then reach out to them and have a quick chat with them by email generally. Um, naturally, when you send them your book or the first few chapters, they're gonna read them, they're gonna give you some form of feedback on it. Oh, I love your characters, I think this could be better, I think you're starting the story in the wrong place, whatever. See if the first things they tell you about your story resonate with you or not. Do you use my pen name or real name in my website, on Twitter, etc.? You use your pen name everywhere. If you want to publish under a pseudonym, how can you make sure that the name is not already being used? Um, you Google it or you put it into Amazon and you see what the results come up. Uh, I don't think there's any legal problems in using a pseudonym that's already, no, there will be some legal problems. So yeah, make sure it's not, uh, it's not already used, Google it. If agents keep saying it's not the right style for us or our agency over and over, what does that mean? They, re they say they represent my genre. So why isn't it the right style? Style is a very complicated and vague word. Um, in my experience, it means that your book doesn't stick to the requirements and expectations of readers in that genre. So it might be a question of tone, it might be a question of voice. Certain genres have very, very specific voices and structures. Um, the best way, the be I think the best thing would be to get an editor to take a look at your, at your book, freelance editor, or to answer those agents and ask them, what do you mean by style? Um, if they've already given you that feedback, I'm sure that some of them will be happy to give you a bit more and explain a bit more about that because yeah, it's very it's very big. But if they don't hire a freelance editor, tell them, here's the feedback I got from agents. I don't understand what does it mean. They'll read your book and I'll be able to give you detailed information on what exactly isn't clicking with agents, whether it's your voice uh, or your characters or the fact you're blending genres, I don't know. Shoot, and how do you copyright your manuscript? Uh, I've got a blog post about this. Um, can I send you a link in answer to that, actually? Sorry. Um, I'm actually searching for a blog post that we've written about this because the answer is a bit complex. You can copyright your book, should you? Probably in the US, yes. And you can follow the steps. So I've sent it to you all in answer to your question. I hope you got it. I'll send it to you privately as well. Cool. Um, 
these are a lot of questions. I might have to skip a few of them uh, in there. So how do you find out what is selling right now? Don't focus on what's selling right now uh, because the time by the time you write it um, and you send it around to agents, it might not be selling anymore. Do not write into trends. Honestly, I mean, unless you write, you write super, super fast, unless you can like put out a book in a month, like uh, a lot of old romance authors can, don't, for, don't worry about trends. That's, yeah, that's my best advice on that. Do I need to limit my search for an agent to my own country? Um, yes. Usually, yes. Uh, if you do not write in your mother tongue, um, search for an agent in the country of the language of your book. So if you're, I don't know, if you're in Europe, in France or Italy or Spain, and you write a book in English, look for an agent in the UK. Probably the like the closest place to where you live that speaks the language of your book. Is if it is well is it well received if I can translate my book in another language myself? It's not going to play make any difference, honestly. I all publishers will have their own translators and they will very very rarely um, want the author to translate their work themselves. Cool, thank you. Thanks, uh, Donna, for the kind words about the webinar. Um, yes, Wattpad is exactly how you spelled, you spelled it. So W-A-T-T-P-A-D. Um, do eBooks ever get reviewed by big book clubs like Oprah? Yes, they... Can I, it depends what you mean by ebooks. All books nowadays are ebooks. Um, if your book is only available digitally, it's unlikely that Oprah is going to cover it. However, if you self publish your book, you can make it available as an ebook and as a print book. Like, there's no extra effort to do that. Then getting it reviewed by Oprah, um, I don't know how it's going to happen. If you're friends with her, then ask her. Other than that, you can hire a publicist, but that's a very, very long shot. And I don't think that's the best way to sell books anymore, honestly, getting them reviewed by Oprah. The best way to get it reviewed by Oprah is to write a best-selling book and getting a lot of buzz around it, and she finds about it herself. If you decide, ah, great question about a publicist related to Oprah. Um, should you hire a publicist if you self-publish? We've got publicists on Reedsy. I do not necessarily recommend you hire a publicist. If you're a fiction author, I do not recommend you hire a publicist. If you're a non-fiction author, I can recommend you, you hire a publicist if you've got something really interesting to pitch. Um, if it's like newsworthy book or if it's like fits into a current um, non-fiction trend, uh, I mean, we've had like book by an Uber driver at the time of like, all the uber scandals um then he made sense for him to hire a publicist and try to get into the, all those publications that were covering the uber scandals um, so if you've gotten yeah something if you think your book has a potential uh message to sell to journalists then get a publicist otherwise i would say get a professional marketer and learn all you can about digital marketing uh, how Amazon algorithms work, how Facebook ads work, all these things are going to are gonna sell, help you sell more books than, um, than traditional publicity. And also publicists are really, are, tend to be quite expensive and it's very, very uncertain whether you're going to recoup your money or not. Um, I have a collection of short stories, manuscript newly done. What is your opinion on competitions run by publishers where they ask you to submit the whole manuscript. If the, if the publisher is reputable, then yes, go for it. Um, I mean, check the rules of the competition. There are a lot of scam competitions out there, so check who is running the competition, um, whether there's an entry fee or not, make sure that they're not 
acquiring or getting the rights in some way to your material if you submit it to them. That's like it would be incredibly scammy, but I'm sure it can happen. Uh, so check those things. And other than that, yeah, it's a good opportunity. Different crowdfunding companies, which ones do I recommend? So I'm thinking you're talking about crowdfunding publishers. If that's the case, I recommend <clears throat> unbound.com, U-N-B-O-U-N-D.com. Um, they're UK based, but I'm sure they work with US authors as well. And US based Inkshares, I-N-K-S-H-A-R-E-S.com, I think, yeah. Um, you will get the slides again, you'll see their logos, Unbound and Inkshares. If you click on the logos, you'll get taken to, your, to their websites. What on average do your freelance editors charge? Um, I had a slide about that earlier. Uh, let me see if I can go back to it super quickly to answer your question in a graphical way. There you go. This is what our freelance editors and I'd say freelance professional freelance editors in general overall charge for the different types of editing. Again, you'll get the slides, you'll be able to view those numbers again and again. Um, all books require fact checking, whether they're fiction or nonfiction. Can you provide some general tips on fact checking? Uh, I, I'm not sure about like books requiring fact checking. If you're writing fancy, you need to, it's more about consistency in your world building rather than fact checking. Um, first, I'd recommend you hire a copy editor, specialized in your genre. If it's historical fiction, someone who specializes in historical fiction and the period you're writing in, they're going to help you um, fact check your manuscript. <clears throat> if you're writing fantasy, copy editor specialized in fantasy and world building, they're going to be able to make sure that your world, world building and characters are consistent. Um, then you, if you're creating a new a new world and also in, want to ensure consistency around your characters, you might create a style sheet for your manuscript and also note down any characteristics of the characters, blue eyes, color of their hair, uh, personality traits and things like that to make sure that you're consistent throughout the book. Um, other than that, tips on fact checking, specifically, I don't have many of them. I mean, whenever you're citing a fact in your manuscript, <laughs> check it. Um, sorry, I can't be more helpful on that. Can a 111,000 word YA sci-fi suspense novel attract an agent or is it too long? A YA sci-fi suspense, um, it's too long. To be very honest, if it's your first book uh, and it's YA, if it wasn't YA, if it's just like sci-fi suspense or like high sci-fi space operas and stuff, you could get away with it. If it's YA, it's really tough. Um, you know what? Hire an editor and get an editorial assessment or w get beta readers to take a look at it. The length per se is not a problem, but generally a high length like that indicates that for this market, you probably have some slow moments in your manuscript or you're probably are over describing or there's too much things going on at the same time and editors and beta readers are going to help you spot that and naturally your book will go down to 70 80 90 thousand which is the average length there's a reason why there's an average length for most manuscripts out there uh, it's because readers um like certain things to happen like a certain amount of information certain amount of action uh, and if you write more of one of these, then you're going to get out of the average. And if you do it well, then it's perfect. But most of the times, first time authors, they don't do it well. So stick to word count. And also, because related to your question, if you're going to query an agent, you do not want to give them any reason to say no to your manuscript. If the agent is tired at the end of the day, is looking at their slush pile, they're going to go very quickly through the submissions. And if they see a high word count, it's a already a reason for them to dismiss your man, your query letter without even looking further at it. So get rid of that reason. How long can it typically take to find the right agent? Oh, from three months to five years. 
I exaggerated with the five years. Uh, that would incorporate a lot of rewrites of the manuscript. But expect, like, don't give up before you've queried at least 30, 40 agents. And with uh, querying five at a time and getting feedback, that's probably going to take you up to a year. I don't know. Yeah. That'd be realistic. What's my opinion of Book Baby as a company? They're um, they're self publishing services company, so they will offer editing services, design services, and things like that. Um, unlike Ritzy, they're gonna work in that you send them a manuscript and it comes back edited. So they're gonna automatically pair you with a freelance editor you know nothing about. So obviously, I'm not gonna recommend that. Uh, they're also mostly, I mean that's how I started. They're mostly a distributor. So you can use them to distribute your eBooks and your print books. Um, you can do that. However, they're not the distributors I typically recommend. And we can have a chat about that probably separately because I cannot get into the specifics of eBook and print book distribution. I'm writing a long blog post about it. Um, but yeah, hit me, send me an email if you want more info on that. What do you think about ghostwriters or co-writing? Co-writing is not a bad idea if you find a good like uh, co-author. Ghostwriting is expensive. It's very expensive. Getting a um, 80,000 word manuscript ghostwritten will cost you more than $50,000 if you hire a professional ghostwriter. If you have the fence for that, go for it. For fiction, I really don't think it makes sense. For nonfiction, if you know you can like move a lot of copies uh, when it's published, then yeah, hire a ghostwriter. Definitely recommend it. Does a high word count attract agents or publishers? It is unattractive to agents and publishers. You should stick to word counts, to average word counts in your genre. And we've got a, again, we've got a post on our blog on average word counts for novels. Uh, so you can take a look at that. I might include it in the slides for, for, the, for, the, for when I send you the slides back. That way you have it. And I'm through most of the questions. Uh, and I see there's still a lot of you left. So thank you so much for staying until now. I really am losing progressively my voice. I'm sure that you'll have noticed. I'm sorry about that. I hope that you still were able to um, listen uh, to me and learn a few things today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Always happy to get feedback on my presentation so I can make them better for, uh, for next time I'm asked about the subject. Remember those little link? Uh, Ritzy.com slash loves slash WD stands for Writer's Digest. You'll get those, this $20 discount. And have a good day. Happy writing. Happy publishing. You've got my email address. If you've got any personal questions uh, for me, go for it.